But what I'm doing is legal. This is why I believe I'll receive justice in the Howard Court. He hit more to right and right center than the left. Oh, it is gone! He did it! He did it! It doesn't matter what your background is and where you come from. If you have dreams and you have goals, and that's all that really matters. Charlie. The freedom of expression that the entire world could see. Our world could see. When you black, it's not a movement. It's a lifestyle. This is who we are. It's easy to focus on the salacious stuff. I am deeply sorry for my irresponsible and selfish behavior I engaged in. It's perfectly reasonable to focus on arguably the greatest comeback in sport. Getting myself into position to, to win the Masters was, uh, it, it took a lot out of me. It was a very emotional week and one that I keep I keep reliving. It's hard to believe that I, you know, I, I, I pulled it off and I, you know, I ended up winning the tournament. And necessary to report on the life-changing nature of the road accident, which threatened to end the greatest golf story of all. His recovery may take a long time, months to years, and it may not be complete. Uh, we know that the injury to Tiger's legs uh, involves the upper and lower portions of the tibia or his, his shin bone, the ankle, and his foot. Personally, being a very big Tiger Woods fan, I would say, unfortunately, it's very, very unlikely that he returns to be a professional golfer uh, after these injuries. The career of Tiger Woods in summary, 14 majors by the age of 32 before sinking in a sea of smut, a return limited by injuries, an addiction to painkillers and a DUI conviction. Then, the most miraculous master's comeback, a character rebuild, until horrible leg injuries and a single vehicle smash in February 2021. But for all that drama, the biggest, most relevant part of the Tiger Woods story is still its beginning. In his first season as a pro, after unprecedented success as an amateur, he won the U.S. Masters. And what a win for symbolism in the Deep South at Augusta, Georgia. At 21, the youngest winner, by 12 shots, the biggest margin. It was a win which changed the direction of the sport at a professional level, but more importantly, as the first golfer of color to win a major tournament, Tiger's win reshaped the perception of who played the game. You've become a role model for young players. You're only young yourself. Is it fair, do you think, that you have all these extra responsibilities on your shoulders apart from just getting around the golf course? No, I think that's, that's an honor and a privilege that uh, people think that highly of you. And if you're a role model, um, doesn't matter if you're a school teacher, a uh, police officer or even a parent. If you're in a position to influence people in a positive way, I think you're, you're very lucky. It was all so positive. Sponsors, advertisers, and the game's administrators adored him. They said Tiger could do anything he wanted. The worst thing was, he believed them. The HBO documentary on the life of Tiger Woods, released at the start of 2021, 
detailed in stark, even disturbing fashion, the pressure under which he was raised to become the greatest golfer ever. His father, retired Lieutenant Colonel Earl Woods, was of African-American, Native American, and European descent. His mother, Kultita, was of Thai, Chinese, and European ancestry. Earl Woods believed his boy was put on Earth to build a bridge between all the different tribes and races of humanity. But the impossibility of that task was laid bare two weeks after the Masters, when he was asked about his multiracial heritage by Oprah Winfrey. He agreed he was bothered by being labeled African-American because he didn't want to deny his mother's Asian roots. And he said that growing up, he had devised his own word, Koblenasian, a mix of Caucasian, Black, American Indian, and Asian. Some felt it reasonable enough, if a little clumsy. But many prominent members of the black community felt let down. When Tiger admits having a problem with being referred to as an African American, it is as if he thumbed his nose at an entire race of people, wrote Mary Mitchell of the Chicago Sun Times. The controversy did nothing to slow Tiger's incredible rise to the top of his sport. But thereafter, he always seemed uncomfortable discussing race. And if he could not build Earl's Bridge for humanity, he did, at the very least, widen the pathway to golf for those of any color who might have felt their way was blocked. In his Sunday Red, he'd become the most intimidating figure golf had ever seen. But even then, the aggressive power swing of his youth was playing havoc with his body and forced a swing change. He was winless in majors in 2003 and 2004, but every other year between 99 and 2008, he won at least one. No one could have foreseen that it would be a much longer wait until his next major victory. Tiger married Swedish model Elin Nordgren in 2004, and in 2006, his world was rocked by the death of his father, Earl. On the bare statistics, these major life events would seem to have had little effect on his tournament play. 2005 to 2009 were statistically some of his best years, winning six majors. The only year he didn't top the money list was 2008 when a knee injury limited him to just six starts for four wins. But the world was soon to discover that not all was what it seemed in Tiger's world. His unraveling began with National Enquirer and Star Magazine stories of a cheating scandal and when his multitude of affairs became apparent to wife Elin, she reportedly flew into a golf club wielding rage. Chased from his home, Woods ran his SUV and his public image into a tree. He lost a series of endorsements, entered a clinic for sex addiction, slipped to 58th in the world rankings and got an expensive divorce. Although he gradually restored his game, climbing back to world number one with five wins in 2013, there was one thing he could never get back. Tiger had lost his invincibility. It hardly seems necessary to back over his struggle of the next four years. 
Suffice to say it was a time of surgery after surgery, a time of pain, insomnia, and self-medication. It's been a while since I've been, uh, one, one fit enough to play. It was more than, than brutal. There were times when, um, I physically didn't know if I could get out of bed. In May 2017, Woods was found to sleep at the wheel of his car, charged with a DUI and sent to rehab. When he emerged from the fog, it was a different Tiger Woods. No less competitive, but with more humility, more generosity, more gratitude. His Tiger Woods Foundation for Kids, entering its third decade, gave him new purpose. Initially, we thought it was going to be golf that was going to change their lives, uh, but Education is far more important and far more impactful. When Tiger won the final event of the 2017-18 season, the Tour Championship, to end a five-year winless run, it would have been impossible to overstate the excitement of the gallery and the buzz which went around the entire golf world. Tiger was back. But even greater joy was to come when in April 2019, this drama-packed career reached its pinnacle. Back where it all began. 22 years after his historic first major, 11 years after his most recent major, Tiger won his fifth U.S. Masters in Augusta. And once again, people of every color were shown that strength of mind can overcome seemingly impossible odds. And just maybe, all those years ago, Earl Woods wasn't too far from the truth about building bridges. Tiger Woods simply went on to transcend race. He was cheered by people from every nation and every color. Because of the dramatic way he won, because of his relationship with his mother and father, because of his relationship with his kids, because of his big smile, and the way he competed. Busting stereotypes doesn't come much cooler than the 1988 Jamaican bobsled team. It's a story so good, it grossed over $150 million at the box office. When the movie Cool Runnings introduced to a world that couldn't believe Jamaica, it has a bobsled team. Over 30 years later, it remains a watershed moment. In the moment, the significance largely escaped me. Uh, and I, I didn't really understand how, how important it was, and that's grown on me over time. The tale is as compelling now as it was in the 1980s, despite the four-man team of Dudley Stokes, Devin Harris, Michael White, and Chris Stokes finishing last at the Calgary Games. Triumph was not measured in gold, but in pride. Jamaica has a rich history of success at the Summer Olympics. And in the mid-1980s, an idea was floated that the island nation's ability to produce elite sprinters offered an advantage in unearthing athletes suitable for bobsled. There was just one problem, the absence of snow and ice on the tropical island. But a core group of young men were identified in the Jamaican Defense Force. Basic equipment was borrowed, 
and training for Calgary 88 got underway in Austria and Canada. It's good for us because we come from the war into the cold for a short time and then back. It's bad for you who have to live here. You should come to Jamaica. <laughs> the adventure was reported as a practical joke in cold weather countries. And such condescension wasn't out of place with persistent mishaps on the way to the starting line. The most notable of these arrived on the eve of the competition when Caswell Allen injured himself in training and had to be replaced by Chris Stokes. Despite Stokes never previously entering a bobsleigh and on the scene in Canada merely to support his brother Dudley. Then, once the competition got underway, Jamaica's first run was disrupted by a mechanical fault, while the second revealed a lack of technique. Run three began promisingly, with one of the fastest starts in the field. But not long afterwards, the sleigh toppled over. Disaster. That day before the crash, I woke up and my temperature was 102 plus. I was very sick. Got to the track, doing the track walk, slipped in the track because I was dizzy and so on. I fell and broke my collarbone. Uh, that was in curve four at Calgary. Walked the rest of the curves to the start house. The physio used the magic spray and then we went out to the block. And as the world held its breath, the courageous Jamaicans climbed out of the wreckage and pushed their carriage to the end of the track before carrying it off. It remains a symbolic moment in Olympic history. I remember my brother and I walking up the track after we, we got out of that sled and immediately we were planning the next year and the next year. Uh, and because of that reaction, it, it's, it's really set the tone for, for my life. It was a moment that typified the spirit of the games and showed that beneath the unlikely exterior, the Jamaican bobsled team were serious competitors. The Stokes brothers competed in three further games, peaking with a 14th place finish in 1994. Nobody dared underestimate them any longer. A generation later, the cool running story went on to inspire the first Jamaican female team to compete at the 2018 Games in Pyeongchang. Carrie Russell and Yasmin Fantalo Victorian finished 18th of 19 in the two-person bobsled, beating the team from Nigeria. And the echoes of the experience of the 1980s continue to reverberate through time. The example set by the courageous four-man unit remains a focus of the modern leaders. Coming back home to Jamaica, I wanted my Jamaican people to see that they can do it and that there's not just one path this way or one path that way to get out of poverty or to make money or to make a name for themselves. If they want to be a Winter Olympian and do alpine ski, now they see their fellow Jamaicans in the Winter Olympics. Unquestionably the most significant fighter in boxing history, Muhammad Ali was a true giant and a hero to people from the halls of the United Nations to the ghettos of Africa. Ali was a three-time heavyweight champion with a 56 and 5 record. But the depth of his fame and cultural significance wasn't reflected in statistics. He was a phenomenon. From winning the title at 22, Ali's charisma, intelligence and social awareness propelled him to the forefront of international recognition. It was a rise that peaked when he regained the title from George Foreman in the biggest boxing match in history the rumble in the jungle.
the fact that uh, me swimming 52 seconds can save somebody's life is really rewarding. I'm really proud of that, and it's something that I carry with me every day. Simone Manuel's parents wanted their daughter to be safe around water, so they took her for her first swimming lesson when she was just four years old. It is a decision that set in motion the obliteration of stereotypes around African-American swimmers and normalized the pool for a generation of black youth. I think it's um, a job and a privilege that we have um, to, you know, really inspire people to get into the sport or try something new or believe in their dreams that they didn't really think that they could possibly achieve. Manuel, affectionately known as Swimon, has blazed a trail from day one. Well, day two to be precise. Because on the second visit to the water in her hometown of Sugar Land, Texas, she swam from one side of the pool to the other. By the age of 16, she had her first world record in the 4x50 mixed medley relay. Three years after that, she left the Rio 2016 Games with two gold and two silver medals. In the process, becoming the first African-American woman to win an individual Olympic gold medal in swimming. This was my first Olympic experience, and I don't think I could have asked for better, walking away with two silvers and two golds. Just being on this team was so inspiring, watching everybody swim so fast got me so excited to swim just as fast. So um, it's the greatest honor to be on this team. And um, yeah, I'm just glad to be here. Manuel's visibility was impossible to ignore and she rocketed to mainstream recognition. The Olympics definitely was, um, I think my biggest eye opener for the impact that I have on the sport, but um, the ability to get more minorities into the sport or get people to want to even learn how to swim. The 2017 World Championships brought five goals and a slew of world records. Then, two years later in Guangzhou, she became the first female American sprinter to win both the 50 and 100 meter freestyle events at a single championship. She claimed seven medals in total, four gold and three silver a new woman's record. Manuel's talent had thrust her into the limelight, and she handled the attention and pressure with grace. I definitely have always wanted to be a role model to people and um, kind of inspire people by my attitude and the way that I carry myself. Manuel credits Venus and Serena Williams as inspirations, as well as pioneering African-American swimmers like Cullen Jones, and Maritza Cojera. She is acutely aware of the slipstream in which she swims and of her responsibility to expand access and opportunity to traditionally underrepresented communities. To further these goals, Manuel has partnered with the LeBron James I Promise School to provide swimming lessons. And she has an inclusion rider written into her contract with swimsuit partner TYR. She graduated from Stanford University, majoring in African and African-American studies. She knows. The COVID-19 pandemic disrupted Manuel's preparations for the 2020 games, leaving Tokyo with just a bronze medal. But that will not be the full stop on a career and a life with much more still to give. This isn't the last time you're gonna see me. And this isn't the last time I'm going to do something great in the pool. And I'm confident in that.